Um, I am going to move through things really uh, quickly. Please, please, please jot down any notes for questions you might have. Um, typically, this presentation can often be an hour, and we're going to go through in um, a little under half an hour, and then we want to make sure and leave uh, time for that question and answer, because candidly for James and me, we have gotten as far as we have today because of these types of um, presentations and then hearing the key questions that come from you. So we've really just tried to um, uh, address those questions here. And okay, and now my screen's not progressing. There you go. Can you see that screen? Yeah, okay. So we start with this really awkward slide of myself because people often wonder why, who is Frog Ferry and why are you doing this? And why isn't it a public transit agency leading this? And so just briefly a little bit about myself. I do have over 30 years of experience um, in Oregon with transportation infrastructure and economic development. I spent 10 years with Business Oregon Part of that was being a co-founder of Cycle Oregon 33 years ago. And I bring that up because way back then, we didn't have a culture around cycling and we didn't have an infrastructure around cycling. We didn't have shoulders on our major roadways for cyclists, for instance. So through the years, we've really seen the evolution and really the adoption and the passion behind cycling. And I see a lot of those parallels here with um, the, the ferry service. Um, I spent 10 years with the leadership team at the Port of Portland. I was a vice president at Greater Portland Inc. and Travel Portland. And then I spent five years with a um, legacy helicopter uh, company, an Oregon company called Ericsson, that specializes in emergency response, particularly battling really big forest fires. And then I've been a student pilot here in the area. So flying over the rivers and particularly up to the Puget Sound area and um, seeing the ferry service as far as I can see, I just was really curious, why aren't we using our river systems? And particularly, this is going back four years ago, as I was starting to see the stories about highway um, widening and all of the, the, the dollars going in to transportation infrastructure and our ever increasing um, greenhouse gas emissions and just wondering there's there's just got to be a better way. So I never intended to start this. This was just, you know, the curiosity killed the cat. And that's certainly what happened here is I learned more and more and got more and more passionate about this opportunity. So we just believe the status quo of planning and investing in road and rail and um, just doing the same thing over and over again without looking at best practices and emerging technologies is not wise for Portland. Um, and we believe an effective transportation system provides choices and that there's really a lens of social and climate equity. So very quickly for the four years of where we've been, going back to 2017, all, almost to the month, um, I took a Saturday and I just started doing research and um, in a couple of weeks, I put together a little project plan. I did some outreach to some of the ferry leaders in Seattle and San Francisco. Many had connections here in Oregon. And, and I just said, do you think it could be done here? And my intention was to gather a lot of the data and the best practices and then to bring it back to our transit officials. And that's what I did. I went to PBOT and ODOT and TriMet and Metro and said, you know, here are these resources in San Francisco and Seattle. They say they do believe it can be done. They're very willing to help us look at this model. And our local transit officials said, whoa, 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 time out. We think this has merit, but we don't have the capacity to take this on and we don't have the expertise. We think you should take this on and we'll partner with you. So this was, this was how really Frog Ferry was born. And in 2018, we hosted a press conference out on the Portland Spirit. We had every media outlet in the region uh, show up and Sue Van Brocklin's on our board and she's done the pro bono PR. And she was like, I can't believe it. This is all we do really in stage press conferences. It's just so rare to get this kind of media turnout. And so we had these, these really great stories that came out, but what happened then was we had the private sector calling us saying, we love this idea, we wanna help out. 
And so it was just really through all of this passionate interest that we kept going. And we had meetings with the local public transit agencies and they said, okay, there are three different studies you need to conduct. And if you look over on the right hand column where it says delivered in orange, those are the three different studies. They said, we had, we had raised money for it. Whereas, you know, the public transit agencies have a budget. So keep in mind, we're a little nonprofit. We had to raise about um, half a million dollars and we did. And so you can find the best practice case study report the demand modeling study and the operational feasibility study and finance plan all out on our website. And I'm happy at any point, you can email me at susan at frogfairy.com. So happy to have a conversation with you or take you through those findings. And then in uh, for 2020 and 2021, our board, and there are eight of us on the board, we chartered three key goals. And so you'll see them at about five o'clock on the screen. Goal one is Go ahead and raise the money for and conduct and deliver that operational feasibility study and finance plan. We did that. Those public transit agencies have all validated the results. They believe our assumptions. They believe we've been super conservative. Um, they had a voice in how we set it up. Um, and clearly that feasibility study says this can be done. It doesn't mean it's easy, but clearly this is feasible. Our second goal was then to secure a public agency sponsor to make a request of the Federal Transportation Administration or FTA for funding. So the FTA has a passenger ferry fund and that is a, a pot of money that the state of Oregon does not regularly go after. And that budget this year is $60 million. And as many of you know, Congressman DeFazio oversees transportation infrastructure. So that pot of money, of money has actually grown. And the Portland Bureau of Transportation, under the leadership of Commissioner Hardesty, actually agreed to be our sponsor in January. That's a big, big deal. Um, and then goal three is to build out a pilot project proof of concept to launch in summer of 2022. And we know that's super ambitious, but I'm going to speak to that in just a minute, as well as um, where that route is. So just in the three buckets of phases, we've done a lot of research and outreach. Um, I do want to point out for, for that coalition building, we have about 1,600 stakeholders um, um, behind us on this effort. Nine volunteer teams comprised of about 200 active volunteers and um, to date uh, have uh, generated or provided a value of about $6 million from the private sector um, conservatively. And then for phase two, we're at the start of really the planning and building out and, and uh, funding a pilot project proof of concept. And we had our board meeting earlier today. And so James and the board, we went through the pro forma and there's a lot of detail there. We're working with a really exceptional uh, ferry consultant named John Sainsbury out of Seattle. This is all he does for a living. He worked with us for two years pro bono just really wanting to help out Portland and, and we got a little bit of money. And so we've actually been able to pay him um, as he's been conducting the feasibility study and the pro forma. And then phase three is for 2024 to start operating um, a public ferry service. So not to say, oh gosh, we're gonna have nine stops right off the bat, but really to begin growing that. And our mission, I'm not gonna read everything word for word, but I think it's really important to understand this is for a public ferry service, so not privatized. This would be much easier to do this privately. There's private money out there, but it's super important to us that this is accessible to everyone here in the Portland region. We really want to keep the cost down and for this affordable to everyone. And so that's why we really come at this. And it, like I said, it's more difficult to do this as a public transit um, mode, especially us not being a public agency, but the ethos behind this has always been for this to be accessible to everyone. And this is for a passenger ferry service. And I say that because a lot of times people think of Washington State ferries. It's very, very different. Washington State ferry system all takes autos. And so the operation's different and the financing behind it's different because they have a fuel surcharge that helps pay for it. So these are much smaller vessels just for, for passengers. Um, we think there's some really important objectives behind our work. 
Um, so I, we think there's a wonderful opportunity to really showcase our indigenous past and the role of indigenous peoples today. And Frog, our namesake, um, the artwork was created by the chair of the Chinook Nation, Tony Johnson. And I had the benefit of working with him when I was with the Port of Portland. And he and um, the one of the tribal artists, Adam McIsaac, um, did a major installation with the Port of Portland. And as a thank you, they gave me a lithograph of Frog. And Frog is amphibious and is said to have taught the um, indigenous peoples how to fish by going down to the riverbank, collecting nettles and stitching them together to create nets and they represent good luck. So that's where frog comes from and it's hard to see back there but that's the lithograph they gave me about 11 years ago of frog um, and it was literally looking up at him and going that's the name. Um, obviously resilience planning and emergency response is very important in the age of a pandemic. We know that having vessels on the water for river cities is considered very, very important. The San Francisco ferry system called WIDA is Water Emergency Transit Authority. So their funding and their whole creation was based on being prepared for a, the next earthquake. And we created a white paper last summer that's out on our website that speaks to the advantages of river cities having those assets on the river. Um, the equity benefit is exceptionally important to us and James is our chair. I just feel like he is constantly reminding us of the importance of it. We have a community benefit plan that we started James two, two and a half years ago, three years ago. We ha we've had um, open houses and events um, at Cathedral Park and the BES Water Lab and uh, as well as at, at James Condo um, on the South Waterfront and he's made breakfast for us. Um, and we've most recently been working with Sunrise PDX on that plan and evolving it. And their voice and perspective has been enormously instrumental in, in building that out. The low operational subsidy I'm gonna to get to in just a minute. Um, and then uh, the last thing I really wanna mention over on the right-hand side is for funding infrastructure costs um, by the FTA, that Federal Transportation Administration, that match is 80% from the federal government and 20% local. And I mention that because nearly all transportation projects in Oregon, it's a 50-50 match of local versus federal. So the federal government really likes to help fund ferry projects. And then really the, the biggest calling of this at all is that we want to connect our residents with their rivers. And I'm born and raised here um, in Portland. And until I got involved with this effort, I don't think I'd actually been on the river like more than five times. Um, my children are young adults. Um, and there's just very few opportunities to access the, the river and the river system. And so we're working with the Human Access Project. Um, we'll be there with the Solve Cleanup on Saturday. Um, Willie Levinson is the, the founder there. He's become a very close personal friend to us. We believe we share really a, a common goal here of um, of really fostering a greater sense of stewardship of the importance of the river because largely the, the river is viewed as an impediment here from a land use planning perspective as something to get over rather than connecting people with, um, it, with the environment. Uh, we know commuter ferries are a proven worldwide concept. Uh, the top 80 river cities in the world all have some sort of water-based transit. Um, there are only four major river cities in the nation that don't have water-based transit and Portland is one of them. And we know we've got issues with congestion, even with a pandemic. And we can see how, even though we had a decrease for a bit um, during COVID with greenhouse gas emissions, how they've shot right back up. Um, I just wanted to include this slide to give you a sense of some of the historic artwork um, as well as present day. And at one o'clock here, you'll see a cross section of a carving of a canoe that Adam McIsaac did. And, and so um, James and I have been working with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. So that's kind of the larger tribe. So Tony Johnson with the Chinookan tribe introduced us to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. And so we've been talking with them and, and the leadership there of 
um, their cultural outreach and art program about how we can weave in their designs, let alone their narrative um, for our work. And this is an animated map of the route. And I want to point out that you're going to see nine different stops here. And we, again, we don't see these stops as beginning immediately, um, but these are stops that the transit leaders at the public agencies identified as um, having a demand there and also having pretty good connectivity to the rest of, I call it the transit grid. So looking at that first and final mile because you got to get to and from the docks um, as well. And so uh, John Sainsbury, our ferry expert likes to say, um, he or her, whoever owns and operates the docks is king. You know, putting a ferry on the water is fairly binary. It's kind of like putting a bus on the water but it's really that land um, interface that's very important. And so we really need to have a partner on the land side for each one of these. Um, for the uh, pilot project, we're looking at starting that from Cathedral Park down to River Place. It's kind of there on the, the south side, on the west side of Portland. And I'll show you a map of that in just a minute. That commute today for employees at OHSU coming out of St. John's and Cathedral Park is over an hour, according to OHSU and the, um, the transportation staff there. Um, on the ferry, it's about 26 minutes. So just to kind of give you a sense, um, and our ferries would be operating at maximum speed at about 24 um, knots and within the city, it won't be quite that fast because they're, they're not going very far. This is not exactly what our vessel would look like. Um, we'll be announcing that in about six weeks. Um, we have um, already completed the specifications of the vessel and we do have a design for it. And the reason is one of the top ferry builders in the nation came to us last summer and said, we have had two contracts fall through due to COVID. Um, we're in a pretty good position for cash. We really believe in your project and we've never done this before, but we're willing to design, build, and lease you a vessel for the first time they've ever done it, just to help us get a pilot project on the river. So that's part of why we've been able to move so quickly on this. Um, this vessel on the Potomac is a double-hulled catamaran, very stable. One of the first things I did was kind of run um, by our approach for the vessel and the specifications with the US Coast Guard. Um, the capacity would probably there'd be two sizes of the vessel when we go to further down the road, a 70 passenger and a 100 passenger for the pilot project we're looking at a 70 passenger um, bicycle storage for uh, 12 to 13 spots on it. And um, we, we like showing this approximation of the vessel because We've had people say, oh, you're going to be raising the bridges all the time and impeding um, auto traffic. And that's not the case. Um, likely, it's five to probably seven days a year we'd need to ask to raise the lower bridge of the steel bridge, which is the rail bridge. Um, our intention for the future is to have a fully electrified fleet. And um, we are posting a number of uh, kind of best practices for ferry systems around the world. So electrification, um, bringing in hydrogen fuel cell to actually prolong the uh, electrified charge is out there. For a pilot project, we're not going to have time for the design engineering and looking at the environmental considerations um, in time for that. So down the road, we really want to do that and do that the right way. For the pilot project, we plan to put in a traditional diesel engine. But what's very, very important here is that we would be using renewable diesel or R99. And I have had a couple of folks question if there are adequate sources here. And actually, we, we have been working with some of the suppliers here. Um, so for that pilot project proposal, if you look at the right-hand column, it'd be one 70-passenger vessel running six days a week, about 14 hours a day from Cathedral Park to the South Waterfront. And that ticket price would be um, $3 is what we run the pro forma on and a dollar to $2 for honor, honored citizen pricing. Our target audiences, just briefly, our bread and butter are gonna be commuters. That's reliable income we can rely on starting at five in the morning and running on the hour, probably 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 
on to 10 a.m. and then crisscrossing the river during the day. And then on Saturdays, we can do more excursion type things. So OMSI has actually a pretty good dock now. They really want us bringing families to visit them. Milwaukee has said, gosh, for our music festival, could you come and, and bring people to our dock that we have out there in the summer? Sure, could we call on Vancouver a Saturday a month? So we're looking at all those different opportunities. Lots of supporters and stakeholders. This is a very, very complex initiative, by far the most complex um, project I've ever worked on in my career. And um, it, it's just having everyone talk to one another. And I know we've got some folks on from the FDA and the DEQ. We have a Kaizen session in June with 10 different state and um, federal agencies we're really excited about because the more we have all these agencies talking um, together, the better off we are. We, have, we do a lot of one-off um, conversations, but it really is helpful when we're all integrated. And then nine volunteer teams. And we actually had 50 volunteers we took out on the, the river a year and a half ago. And we're really looking forward to being able to do that again. But as you can see, this is taken at Cedar Park. We had three donated vessels um, being able to run the river. Here are four of the teams. Yeah, so, like so I think somebody's on the call might need to mute. Um, and so maritime operations, we have quite a few folks out of the Seattle market that have been helping us pro bono. Strategy and public affairs, um, we have a great group of people there. Nina Bird is a board member really specializing in um, uh, corporate sponsorships and partnerships, strategy, um, DEI programs, really, really bright. And she's an avid paddleboarder who lives down at the South Waterfront near James. So she's brought a tremendous value to our, our board. Our engineering team, um, Kevin is with Intel, Daimler, we have a number of engineers there. And with PGE, we do have letters of support from both um, Pacific Core and PGE as we're looking at the electrification and those needs. Um, our public agency sponsors or partners, I should say. Um, the finance team, Scott South is our former board chair. He and then Dan Bowers, executive director of Portland Streetcar. And he spent, I think, 17 years with um, the Portland Bureau of Transportation and Portland Streetcar. So really knows the city of Portland and how it works. So he's been a wonderful, wonderful mentor to me. Uh, community fairs, there's my fearless leader, James Paulson, and the chair of our community outreach. Um, Charlene Seidel it recently joined our board. Um, a prominent business leader from the South Waterfront. We'd really hoped to stage our home port down the Zydell property, um, but there is a remediation berm the entire length of their property. So we realized that wasn't available to us, but she's been helping with a lot of the introductions to the business community. Private sector providers, we're so grateful to. Marketing communications, Allison Tibnon and Sue Van Brocklin. Uh, on our board. And then we're just starting up the customer experience team. Um, so that'll really be focusing on the customer experience, but particularly looking at mitigating infectious diseases. We have a couple experts who um, came to us and said, we really wanna help with that. We know there's really good airflow in vessels like this, but let's take a look at the HVAC systems. And we're, we're talking with the boat builder about that as well. And just making sure that if you are, um, maneuvering uh, throughout your day in a wheelchair um, that we have someone representing, you know, a number of different needs um, for the transit. At a very high level, this is kind of your a cheat sheet for the operational feasibility study, um, which is about 130 pages long, but it's actually a pretty interesting read. I, I hope several of you will go check it out. So looking not at the pilot project, but at a seven state, we call that a steady state operation, seven vessels. The capital costs um, all in are about 40 million. I honestly, after today's conversation at a board meeting, I think that's gonna be a little bit higher, but it gives you a sense scale wise of what we're talking about. And $40 million, a lot of money to you and me. I'm a fiscal conservative. For transportation project, it's really small. Um, operating costs about 6.8 um, for the year. Ticket revenues about 3 million. Annual subsidies about 2.5 million. 
we will have some concession sales and sponsorships um, added into that. And then ticket prices for the public ferry service, we think that average will be about $5. And it's at that rate based on probably the ticket price from Vancouver to downtown Portland would be about $6.50 or even $7. That's a 45 minute uh, ride. So just comparing that with other ferry services and the subsidy and total cost, it's why that goes up a bit. Kind of crisscrossing the river is probably more in the, the $2 range. And then an honored passenger ticket price as well for low income, for students, for veterans, for seniors. And I, I would imagine for children under 12 will want to have that be free. We really want to encourage families getting out on the river to connect with the green space. So this is a map showing Cathedral Park down to the South waterfront. Um, for OHSU pre-COVID, they have had 500 employees a day, Monday through Friday, commuting from St. John's and Cathedral Park down to OHSU. During COVID, it's about 300 a day. And then we're also looking at the connectivity with the PSU campus. You know, PSU has 26,000 students. So we've been in recent conversations with their transportation leaders there. And so they're putting together a survey for students and faculty and, and their campus community who live in St. John's and Cathedral Park. And um, many of you may know, but um, there have been discussions of putting together a shuttle there through St. John's and Cathedral Park down to the dock, I guess for many years. Um, and Jennifer Vitalio, who is the former uh, chair of the Cathedral Park Neighborhood Association, has talked about this. And so they're kind of resurrecting that conversation now about starting a small business to provide that shuttle service. We really, really want to mitigate people driving and parking and driving. That's that's really counter to what we're trying to do here. We're really trying to get people out of their cars. Um, and you'll see in the operational feasibility study all the ways people can access that dock. So if you're walking or you're biking or you're taking a scooter or it's called a kiss and ride if someone's dropping you off, um, if as someone is like going to take a child to school. Um, so we're looking at, at overall what that total throughput is and we'll be doing some surveys um, with the residents there. Um, and this is the pilot project. And I just like this little diagram showing the electrification process on it. Um, and uh, under the total cost, we're looking at that being $8 million for it's called planning, mobilization and operations. Um, James and I, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the, the revenue opportunities for this. And I, I want to keep in mind is, you know, people often say, oh, you should make the ferry free to everybody. And I would love that so much. But I, I think it's really important for people to understand this is a public private partnership where we're raising every dollar we come up with. We don't have a public entity just writing us checks for this. So we're trying to be very, very conservative. So we make sure we get us off to a great start and that we have adequate funding throughout. And then if, as we're able to toggle back um, for ticket prices, that would be great. And then for those of you that live in the area, this is a, an aerial view of um, the Cathedral Park, the two docks there. Um, Portland Parks has the jurisdiction for the park there. And then the Oregon State Marine Board has provided funding for that South Dock there. So you can see kind of the DCB, that's the South Dock. And so they have an interest in this. And so what we have been suggesting is, can we use that dock? Because we really want to minimize infrastructure. We want to minimize impact with the river. Um, because we know we really need to be really prudent with environmental assessments and considerations for any builds that we have. So we're trying to use existing infrastructure for the pilot project as much as possible um, and put in a flexi float, which is a temporary dock where you see that's E. Um, have people really queue up so they line up at B. We don't want them just waiting and standing on that dock. And we, we'd be looking to reinforce that dock. And by what do I mean by reinforcing? I don't know yet. We have not done the engineering on it. 
We do know that we'd need a railing probably on one side. And so we're very cognizant of the fact that for ADA requirements, and we, we speak to that in the operational feasibility study as well, and also knowing that the funding for the existing dock came from the Oregon State Marine Board, their funding comes from um, uh, licenses uh, throughout the year. So we need to make sure we're leaving that landing and the dock, particularly to the north, available for recreational boaters. The good news, though, in this partnership is if we can come in, get the federal dollars, improve that dock, and we're there for two years for the pilot project, and then we, we move from that, and we've got a couple options then for long term. So the one up at one o'clock, that, that's a bigger dock and, and, and project long term. Um, that's a possibility that we put out there for Portland Parks and obviously there'd be enormous um, environmental considerations and research that would need to be conducted for that. Um, we're also looking at, if, as you look down at the bottom slide, that's an aerial view of Green Acres and that is privately held and um, those, those, the two gentlemen that are, are the new owners there um, they really want to build out kind of a community hub there. And many of you may know there are a number of small businesses there. It's a wonderful community gathering center. They have the, the bee colony there. They do research with OH, uh, OSU. Uh, James and I have been down there um, a few times and meeting with them. And, and they like the idea of having the ferry serve through there because we would provide kind of year around foot traffic through as people are coming through and buying a sandwich and buying a cup of coffee. So we're in conversations with them as well. They just had a Kaizen session um, with, I think, DEQ and um, EPA. And so some of you that are on this call may be aware of that. So we're kind of in lockstep with them um, on this just to see for the future what's going to make the, the most sense for all of us. There you go. So I would welcome any questions you might have for James and me. Uh, thank you so much. That was great. That was fantastic. Yeah. So uh, folks, any questions, um, either just unmute yourself and go forward and ask, or you can put them in the chat as well. I, I just wanted to say, I really am glad you're going forward with the electrification research. Uh, I think that's a really great, uh, great goal. And um, also to sort of ask, um, it seems like uh, it might make sense to make your your uh, pickup nodes somewhere, somehow um, interchangeable with the, the, the mass transit light rail. Is that something that's gone into the calculation at all? It, it looks like a lot of your areas are real close to light rail stations, but I just think looks like that might be a good idea. You know, it's such a good point, John. And um, there's not one easy answer to that. So for instance, um, the city of Milwaukee has said, this is, going back three years ago. We feel like we're pretty well served going into Portland via light rail. So we don't really know if we need it. And gosh, light rail, that connectivity, it's about three blocks away. So looking at demand there, although in talking with Mayor Gamba a couple months ago, he's like, you know what? We might want to actually look at this on a more accelerated time frame." So every stop's a little bit different. and. For instance, there at Cathedral Park, they don't have the benefit of light rail, yet they're very underserved when it comes to transit options. So it, it depends. You know, every single one of these nine stops is sort of like its own business case study, you know, for is there demand, is there need, and how accessible is it? And if it's not accessible, what do we need to do to make it so? Hi, we have a question um, from Alice, um, and she said, have you considered a stop at Swan Island? So, and I see that, that James um, uh, pinged back on that. Uh, for Swan Island, Daimler would love to have a stop there. Um, we would love to have a stop there. Um, Adidas is right up the hill, and we think that would be a natural, and even if they are running um, a, a shuttle back and forth. We know that they they spend quite a bit of, of money every day for employees, you know, pre-COVID for getting them to and from that campus because they are, are really tight on parking. Um, but Daimler, my understanding is their request was denied um, because of the Superfund site. 
Um, that said, um, I do feel like you know Daimler is a supporter of ours. Uh, one of their senior engineers spoke at our first press conference. We have a letter of support from them. So down the road, you know, we'd very much love to include Swan Island. And again, we're agnostic for where the stops are. It's really where this is needed. This is a public service. So um, people ask James and me every week, oh, can you put a stop here? And it's like, you know, we're not precious about the stops. This is all about what's strategic and in the best and highest use for the public. Okay. Um James answered one question about how many ferries would run at any given time from Mamale, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, he said during the pilot, we would be running one, but how many at the peak could be on the river at the same time? So the, the one ferry for the pilot project to James Point, and then the operational feasibility study we've built for seven ferries. So that is likely three 100 passenger ferries and four 70 passenger ferries. Um, could there be more than that? There could be. I don't know that will be in my lifetime. Um, but we came up with that number. And, it, and again, if you go through the operational feasibility study, a lot of how you kind of get to that sweet spot of what is an optimal number is really based on, it's called headway. So how long as a passenger do you need to wait in between the ferry com coming and calling on the stops? And for some stops, it's every half an hour. And for some locations like Vancouver, that is farther out, is every hour. So looking at the demand we know of and building out these uh, ferry dock locations, we're saying seven vessels. OK, that's it. That's all we have for the chat at the moment. I just want to say if um, I had to make a choice, if I wanted to go downtown and take a light rail or ride on the river, I'd say I'd go for the river. Well, thank you for saying that, John. And the research coming out of the San Francisco ferry system um, speaks to the number one preferred mode of a commute um, by San Francisco residents by far are the ferries. And when I went into this, I was like, it's time and cost and time and cost. And obviously, you know, for the economic impact, um, and we're continuing to work on calculations of what that trade off will be in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions and reduction. And so taking a really critical look at that. Um, but John, to your point, that, that research very clearly says, coming out of San Francisco, it's the value of my time. I get on the ferry, it's relaxing. Um, it's reducing my anxiety. I can tend to my emails. I can um, get back to text messages. I can listen to music. I can take a nap. Whereas if you're in a car or on transit, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a very different experience. And so we just think this mode could be a, a real win for people if they're commuters or, or just to go out and see another part of Portland um, and, and connect with the rest of our community because we've become so siloed given all the congestion. Um, an obvious analogy to me is the Grand Canal in Venice and the Vaporetto, which provides pretty much an artery through the city. Um, with, it's almost a water, water bus. Um, but my question is, I live in Cathedral Park. Um, we would love to be able to get on the ferry, go downtown for an event, and be able to get home at night. Will you run late enough to be able to service that kind of use? Well, that's our intention, Doug. And we've talked with the Portland Trailblazers, for instance, and they're saying, gosh, let me make sure that we have um, vessels available for getting people to the game and, and back home. And so for this pilot project, we have to really do this well and do it right. And we'll have two crews. So when you just start looking at the cruise schedules and for commuters starting at 5 a.m., I, I, can't, I can't look you in the eye and say, we're gonna be able to get you home at 11 o'clock at night. But we're looking at 14 hours a day um, based on the scheduling. So you know if that's a 5 a.m. until 7 p.m., 
or you know, 14 hour shift somewhere in there, that's what we're looking at. But long term, we'd like it to be later. And, and we have to, you know, keep these uh, moving relatively um, full. Um, I want to address Bob's question as well in terms of opportunities um, for integrating natural history and environmental education into your activities. And um, Bob, I would love to have your help on that. Um, we, we have a board member, Allison Tivnon, and she's already calling the, the tours that are educational in nature, tadpole tours, um, because it's frog fairy, so tadpole tours. And the uh, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron and Greg Archuleta has, um, he leads um, the cultural outreach um, program there. He's offered to write the narrative from um, the perspective of indigenous peoples and looking back 300 to 20,000 years ago when they would have been living in the area and moving around the, the region um, by canoe. Um, and then certainly for the educational um, aspects around the environment are going to be very, very important to us. So we can get kids out there to see the wildlife, you know, in the air, flying overhead, in the water, seeing a fish leap. Um, me growing up here and my kids, we haven't had that opportunity. And, I, and so honestly, that is, I think, the highest calling of this project is to get people out there and better understanding and respecting um, the wildlife that, that's running right there th through the river. Um, you had said that um, you guys are going to be having um, uh, some space for uh, bicyclists um, on the ferry as well. And I was just reading um, about the ferry, uh, the uh, walk on ferry up in Seattle from uh, between Kingston and Seattle. And um, the, uh, the biking hookup and lock locking mechanisms was a fiasco. Um, because there wasn't a universal um, hookup attachment for the variety of different bike designs, models, shapes. And I'm just wondering if you guys are doing any research <laughs> to make sure you don't make the same mistake. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty embarrassed about that up there. And um, like I said, we have five leaders with Kitsap County and King County Ferry. So those are the two passenger ferry um, groups and they share the terminal there for Seattle. Um, and John Sainsbury, our ferry consultant is very much on top of that. So I've been out on um, several of the ferries up there and just looking at the different modes. And so we wanna make sure we've got the um, ability to move bikes on the, the ferry, but then also with Bike Town, we wanna make sure that we have that connectivity there as well. So we've had conversations with um, Kyle's, the gentleman that runs the bike hub under OHSU. He said, would you guys want me to come in and provide that capability at Cathedral Park? You know, he's like, I'm not looking to make money off of it, but if it helps um, resist our dependence on cars, that would be great. So absolutely, Michael, we're looking at those best practices. We're really trying to learn from other case studies um, and kind of take advantage. And fortunately, it's a really sharing community in the ferry space. It's relatively small, but even looking at New York and Boston, um, look at Brisbane, the, the Clipper, um, Oslo, um, their best practices. Really, Europe is leading in, in this area and particularly for the green technology. I have a question for you. And this is something Michael would probably sign up for. Um, how about if the bicyclist can get on the ferry, hook into something and ride their bike the whole way there, okay. producing enough energy to help reduce your cost and <laughs> get a good workout at the same time? <laughs> and you know, everyone kind of giggles at this. That was in our original specifications. Um, I have so many friends from Cycle Oregon and my cycling friends are all like, Susan, <laughs> we're gonna hold you to this. You really need to make this very bike friendly. So we provided space where we could, we thought we could go ahead and capture cyclists. And um, 
between the specifications and the boat builder, they came back and said, Susan, it's a great novelty. It's a lot of fun, <laughs> but the weight that it would bring to it, and it just reduces our ability to be, you know, really sustainable, um, just from a fuel perspective. Um, and uh, and the cost and all, but I just want you to know that was in there. We tried. I love that idea. Someday. Oh some gosh. Very funny. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we have um, just reached about the time frame where we need to switch to the Brady River. Do you want to take one more comment, Michael? Or take two more. If we got if we got two two more comments, uh, and then we'll we'll okay. switch over. Okay, it looks like Doug is ready to go there. Yeah, from the perspective of the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group, we've been trying to increase awareness of Superfund activity on the river. And obviously, your ferries are going to be going back and forth all day long. The advantage to us is it creates an awareness of the activity on the river. And that involvement of the public um, facil facilitates the fluidity that everyone can do their work. It keeps uh, the contractors honest. It um, creates public awareness of what's going on in the cleanup. So something that might not have occurred to you is going to be a really big boost for what we do on the river. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things I love most about this project is it just helps on so many different ways, I think, improve our community and a number of initiatives that are underway. And so one of the things I'd love to ask you to consider, Doug, is for this group, if you would ever consider a letter of support, you know, even if it's saying we, we support the idea of this or we want to work with you on it. I really welcome any of you on this call tonight. Feel free to email me. It's just susan at frogferry.com. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter that way. You can sign up to be on one of our committees. Um, we, we are very careful with our newsletter list. We, we don't spam, spam you, but just so you can really keep apprised of our work. And Doug, if there are opportunities where we can work with you, kind of like the Human Access Project, you know, we, we testify for one another. Um, we are just helping to raise awareness of one another's causes. And we're just so much more powerful the, the more of us that are speaking to uh, the need for a healthy river. I anticipate we'd be very supportive of what you're doing. So we'll be in contact. Thank you. We have one more question, anyone, anyone? Okay, Susan, James, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. Um, we're super excited to see how this uh, how this all turns out. So, you know, um, yeah, we'll definitely be talking to our board members about uh, sending out some support to you. Um, and um, yeah, this is great. Yeah, thank you so much. So